At this point for me, the flat earth question is less about being right and more about being open to radically new, yet not so new, concepts. We have farmed out experiential existence and natural curiosity so long to experts that we've stopped trusting our own perceptions of the world and reality. It harms absolutely no one to ponder such a seemingly preposterous idea of a flat earth, but so many are relegated to the island of condemnation for even giving the idea of flat earth the time of day. Listen how this asshole named Professor Dave demeans David Weiss. This gas and dust in space, in a vacuum, in zero pressure, how does that work? How come this doesn't collapse in on itself? This is just a- It does, that's how stars are born. Yeah, they so, do collapse. It's yeah, so, how stars form. Dave, in your world, this is gases are collapsing upon themselves and then yeah. igniting themselves in a vacuum, in a in a in a vacuum, and then they they, they burn is, no, 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 stop, and stop. Of look, look, I know that you want to just spew your script without anybody challenging, but you say so many I stupid no things, script, and I'm here to tell you why everything you're saying is stupid. So when you say stars igniting in a vacuum, the reason that's confusing for you is that you think stars are little bonfires. No, because you're a moron because no, you don't you, understand you, nuclear you, fusion you nuclear is, fusion is the process by which stars yeah. glow they're not little fireballs and so you Dave, can learn that by googling something for five seconds but you don't do it now i don't call professor dave an asshole because i'm on team flat earth and he's not i call him that because he's behaving like one I really don't like the flat earth issue as yet another reason for people to get puffy chested about their opinion on the matter. When I hear a flat earther call someone a globetard, it's as grating to me as, well, Professor Dave. But what does fascinate me about the concept are all of the implications of the cosmology of a closed system and the strange correlations that it does have with things mentioned in the Bible and the countless cosmologies of ancient peoples. To me, it does make some strange sense that we might be inside of a firmament where nothing physical can leave and that the path that science has taken with all of its godless reductionist materialism is meant to weaponize this enclosed system in order to encourage us to think that this is all there is. Short, brutish lives bound in coarse matter, created randomly and existing for no reason. No wonder we think it's the same shit but a different day. Reality is magical and multifaceted, and like any experiment in quantum physics, is affected by the observer, which means that the observer is actually a participant, which means that reality is fluidic and ever-changing, but our institutions and fields of study often aren't. They become calcified and stagnant because they are apt to corruption and subject to financial obligations. We must break out of this cycle. We must get back to our place in the natural order. We must be open to things that seem preposterous. Today's guest, Flat Earth Clue Finder Mark Sargent, joins us today to speak about the above and much more. I start off the conversation by asking Mark how he first became interested in the subject at hand. I am what some people would consider to be the Flat Earth recruiter. Meaning if you get into the whole concept of us being in living in some sort of enclosed world, you're probably going to run into my stuff first. And I got into it in the summer of 2014 when I was, I had ran out of conspiracies to look at. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, this seems like a great idea. I'll just check, tick this off my list. I'm not getting any younger. And nine months later, I'm banging my head on the keyboard. And, and so in 2015, I made a series of videos called the Flat Earth Clues. And it was basically just a cry for help and put them out on the internet with all my contact information and said, yeah, yeah, you know what, internet hive mind, hit me with whatever you got, because I'm pretty sure I got this one nailed down. And instead of some academic calling me, I, everybody else did. So seven years <laughs> later, here we are. A whole bunch <laughs> of stuff has happened since then. Yeah, absolutely. And you have two books out? Uh, yes, uh, Flat Earth Clues, uh, The Sky's the Limit, which is based on the original Flat Earth Clues, and then Flat Earth Clues, End of the World, which is a little play on words there, because, you know, I could have said Edge of the World, but End of the World. 
And uh, yeah, so two books on Amazon, uh, and I wrote a survival guide, which is on Amazon, and then uh, the Netflix documentary, and a whole bunch of other little things. So yeah, a lot of is stuff. It, is it still on Netflix? No, it it ran. You know, it's been on. It was on Netflix for so long that it ran its contract out. Oh wow! So it it was on for three years, and then uh, they lost the rights to it, and so now it's on uh, Amazon and iTunes and YouTube Red and all the other places you can. Cool find so fantastic we have yet to see it perhaps we should peruse you really thing. should if you get a chance it is i know that david hates it but it is a very objective <laughs> look at the i mean it's a fair look at a snapshot of the flat earth community back in uh, 2017 when we shot it why did why does david hate it is it not flattering well <laughs> he's a he's a he's probably our biggest purest flat earth cheerleader meaning you know it's got to be it's flat earth or it's nothing Right? There, there is no middle ground. Scientists and astrophysicists, any, anyone wearing a lab coat should all be put on a <laughs> ship and sunk. Right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, but it, it was really, it, it wasn't, if you want to use a drug reference, it wasn't pure, uncut, flat earth. It was very diluted. So it was like, because I sat with studio audiences in, in different film festivals, you know, watching this thing. And it was like, you know, it's like flat earth, flat earth, people getting tense. It's like, okay, good, there's a scientist. Okay. It's, it's safe. Flat Earth, Flat Earth, oh, it's an astronaut. It's fine. It's fine. And it would go back and forth like that to burr at the end of the 100 minutes. People were just, you know, they, they felt safe going in. That was the whole point. And he understood that it generated a huge amount of, um, of buzz in the, in the community that year. So mm -hmm. good for us. And you, are you much of a debater? I know Weiss likes to go into the ring with people who are just <laughs> ready to shoot him down. And uh, I, don't, I haven't really seen you in those same I, sorts of situations. Mo most of the time, I don't. Okay, so it's wonderful. You know, no one's ever asked me that. I have, I have the answers for that question. <laughs> David gets into debates because of how he gets approached. Meaning, uh, if I ever live long enough to write an autobiography, it'll be called unsolicited. I never had to pick up the phone. People just kept calling me with all this stuff. David has people that will go, will call every podcast and say, hey, you want to talk to a flat earther, right? And depending on who they are, yeah, I mean, some people might be receptive, but other people are like, oh yeah, I want to talk to a flat earther. I got, to, I got some things to say. And so David will go into hostile environments all the time. Whereas I hardly ever get into hostile environments. Um, plus, because of what I'm told my nature, um, there, was a, there was this New Zealand journalist. He was the only person to say it. And he goes, he goes, Mark has this goofy warmth that instantly disarms you. And I, and I, and I no one had ever said that about me before in my life. And I was going, and so I started out, I go, goofy warmth, goofy warmth. Is that, is that a thing? And they're going, yeah, that's it. And I'm going, oh, wow. So yeah, uh, hardly anyone. And I mean, I've gone against people that should have torn my head off and they didn't. Um, the most notable being like Piers Morgan. Oh my God, I was so nervous going into that one because I was, I, you know, I'd watched him. I'd watched him on different things. I'm going, he's going to tear me apart. It's not going to be fun at all. And so I'm like, you know, bracing myself and he was fine. He was absolutely, he did not say a disparaging word the entire time. And I'm going, huh, the whole disarming thing must, must actually work. So, <laughs> it's, anyway. it's also a sign of maturity. Uh, I don't remember who I watched. It was Dave and three other guys and only one was really his name was Professor something. I don't remember what his name was. Oh, was... oh, that was the uh, the Professor Dave interview. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Brutal. Yeah. Oh, that was brutal so thing. condescending and, well, and rude. If you knew anything about this guy, um, I highly recommend anyone that listens to this uh, watch the documentary Fake Famous, which is a lot of people don't realize that in the social media world, hits and likes and subs, they are the currency. And you can buy them like anything else. You do not have to earn them. You can buy them. And some people in our community, I'm sure, have bought them. And some trolls have bought them. And this guy, Professor Dave, and I only knew this because when I was well, I was listening in the background to that debate you were talking about. And they said, oh, in our channel, the biggest sub, you know, subscribe, you know, big biggest uh, subscriber base that we've ever seen, you know, a guy with two million subs. And I turn around and go, Two million who? who? Who's got two million, million subs? And it's like Professor David going, the hell he does. And there was, you know, you got that chat room in the side, you know, the live chat room. Mm -hmm. And there was maybe pushing a thousand people in there. 
which is pretty good, you know, for a live chat. Sure. All, they were all us. So if he has 2 million subs and all those people are us, wh who, 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 where, where yeah. are his people at? Exactly. So, yeah. So his only defense is to name call. I mean, you know, and it was embarrassing to watch. I put a comment in that in that thing, and I don't usually comment on a lot of those videos where I said, when you open in the first five minutes with idiot, moron, stupid, and I mean, just nonstop. It was it was tough to listen to, very very tough to listen to. It was like it was like a clinic on how not to debate somebody. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you know that that person is the the opposite of open minded, which you have oh, to yeah. be with a subject like this, you know. Yeah. And and that you gotta remember, that's why his channel was born. The 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 he is a pro troll channel that his whole base is to attack flat earth. That's all it is. So he had to go in doing that. Uh, now he went even over, I think, over the top for his base, you know, even his base. It wasn't fun to listen to, I think, from anybody's standpoint. Yeah. But, Although anyway. the other guys, I don't know who they were. One jolly English dude. <clears throat> oh, they um, were the moderators. Oh, okay. They were yeah, it was just their, it was of, their channel. They were snickering like grade school kids, you know, like, oh, oh my yeah. God. I, I wish, I, wish oh, I could yeah. say that. They were, they told David that they were going to moderate. And at one point I watched, I saw them do it. I, they just turned off their mics. They just hit mute on their mics. And, like, <laughs> and they were going on a separate back channel where they were going, oh, this is great. These guys are just, and David wasn't going to take the bait, wouldn't take the bait. And, and it was because of what I mentioned earlier, he, it's like, you're calling Dave names. That's just, that's just another Tuesday for Dave. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's like it, this guy is not going to do anything to him. The only thing that Dave was upset with was he couldn't get in his points. The guy was just, you know, that Dave was supposed to make a point and the moderators would be, oh, let Dave talk. And it's like, nope, nope. This other guy just, that yeah, was awful. Yeah, it was. It was embarrassing. I felt bad for Dave, although he seemed unflinching. I, I think his... he's bulletproof. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Plus, he's got that app, which yeah. is so, which is so wonderful. It is. It's so when you when you quit your career and do this full time and build this app and put everything you have into it uh, and have it turn out the way it did. I mean, it's it's wonderful. It's absolutely yeah. wonderful. Absolutely. So, what is the the uh, term that I came across in your second book, uh, Flat Earth 2.0. What is that? Flat Earth 2.0. So the original Flat, flat Earth is not a new concept, obviously, which is why it's amazing that it's gotten this big resurgence over the years. Flat Earth for the longest time was just this old concept, right? That's, that's Everyone knows about Flat Earth. It's the only thing we debunk to children. You know, no, we do not talk about any other conspiracy ever to children, but in kindergarten or first grade, depending on when you come in, they all do the same thing, which is like, oh, yeah, by the way, this is the globe. We used to think it was flat. Now it's the globe. And then they put it in the corner of the classroom and it just stays there silent for 12 years minimum. And that's brilliant. So the old school flat earthers really didn't do much, even when the Internet came out. That they weren't, they really weren't doing much. In fact, you could look up the original Flat Earth Society. In fact, I didn't know. In fact, I just got my original card, I think, lying around here. I actually signed up for the Flat Earth Society back in 2014. This is my proof that, because I was the people that, that I went out and made a video saying, don't go to this website. Do not do it. Because it's controlled by trolls. The, the Velvet Rope is actually run by trolls. And I'm thinking, there's only 500 people in that whole thing. And yet you've got dedicated trolls that are sitting up in front going, there's nothing to see here, move along, nothing to see here, it's all a joke, just move along. And it's like, why would you even be bothering? I mean, trolls, to all the trolls out there, if you want to watch people cry, if you want to make people cry, you can go on YouTube all day long and make people cry. <laughs> That's not hard. You can go into any room you want, just thumbs down, make a nasty comment, and and you will you can torture people. And, and to that point, uh, there was a joke I made where... But I wasn't kidding, you know, because I'm old enough to remember when the internet was very, very new, which was if you, you could make a video that has puppies and kittens playing in a children's cancer ward and within 100 hits, guaranteed, within 100, well, within 100 likes, someone's going to come in there and go, this is gay, thumbs down, unsubbed, I hate everything. And, and just because they can and it's like, there's no reason to do that. It's like, no, they don't care. They're just hateful, hateful people. Exactly. So anyway, sorry, circle back. Not Nancy Pelosi. No, no, not, uh, who, who's circle back? Uh, the press secretary who's leaving. Um, 
Jen uh, Pisaki. Jen Pisaki. Yeah, <laughs> and that circle back. I she's ruined the term circle back. Just so you know, she's <laughs> absolutely ruined it. I used to use it. I I re try and refrain, refrain from doing it. So, what happened was when social media started coming out, that flatter society wasn't doing anything, and so we just ignored them and we used to start doing our thing mostly on YouTube. If it wasn't for YouTube, I wouldn't even be talking to you now. And it was like a year and a half after we were just just ripping it up in, in the metrics on YouTube, just shredding them. And all of a sudden I get this guy, never heard of him, called me and said, oh yeah, I'm from the flat earth side. I really like what you're doing. Thumbs up, blah, blah. I'm going, no offense, man, but where the hell have you been? <laughs> Where, who are you? Where? Why haven't you? You should have been there since minute one. And we, you know, and so I said, look, we don't need you. So you can just keep doing what you're doing. And they did. They never did get involved. We did conference after conference. I mean, 2019, I did conferences in seven countries. They never, they never once got involved in anything. And this is ta we're talking about a group whose founding member. Uh, he wasn't, well, I shouldn't say, he was the number one on the list of just because of popularity was Thomas Dolby, the musician. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's and, got his I second mean, the, album is called Flat Earth. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and, there's, and, and I, I, we've, never, we've never spoken to the guy, ever. All these, all these other celebs came out, but, but Thomas Dolby never talked to anyone. There you go. So, well, yeah, we are, we are Flat Earth 2.0. We don't care about the original Flat Earth Society. So everything up until 2015, Flat Earth 1.0. Everything after 2015, 2.0, which is us. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, how much of, of uh, just going right into mainstream science, how much do you think of mainstream science is based on a, a guess or a bluff? Because that's what a lot of this challenge is. People always bring up the science card when, when Flat Earth comes to the of step up to bat yeah yeah that that's a wonderful question and yeah the, a lot of it unfortunately science i think tesla said it best and you probably know this quote where he said that the problem with science is is that yeah they're built on the you know the shoulders of everybody else when you get to a certain level but everybody that climbs on the shoulders never checks out the foundation never reflects on the original foundation so he goes by the time you get up to like six seven eight nine people up he goes the the equations mean nothing because the, the, the chance of error is huge. And science makes mistakes. Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard in my life was when he said, science is true whether or not you believe in it. Which means that science, we, we put our stamp on science, that's it, that's what you have to go on. But, but my quote is, is science is, is, is true only until the day it's not. And unfortunately, when it's not, they never apologize for it. One of my favorite science examples was um, a stupid fish uh, called the coelacanth from years ago. It was an ugly fish with a bunch of extra fins, and they found fossils of it and years ago, and they said, wow, it's obviously been extinct for 70 million years. And every scientist in the world, every single one of them, would have put the bet the farm on it that this thing was gone for 70 million years. Well, then the, the British Navy caught one off of South Africa and then another one off of Mozambique and then another one off of Madagascar. And pretty soon, all of a sudden, National Geographic swimming, you know, got scuba divers going, hey, you know, these things are everywhere, right? So the question is, how did they get that so completely, absolutely put in a certificate you can frame wrong? And the reason is, is because, well, they just, they reinforce each other without checking each other's work. Meaning it's like, well, I obviously have the pictures of the fossils and this guy, we've done so many studies on these fossils have to be right. It's like, well, yeah, but they weren't. They weren't. And and I use cryptozoology, which is, you know, the, the, the animals thing so often because it's so easy to do. Uh, until the, the giant panda was found, it was an absolute myth and they laughed at it. And same thing with the giant anaconda and the giant squid. Giant squid is one of my favorite examples because we still never caught one of the big ones. The only reason we even know this they, they exist is because we found the remains in the you know the bellies of sperm whales that came to the surface. You'll never catch one, ever, ever, ever. Uh, Peter Benchley, the the guy that wrote Jaws, would have loved to have made a movie, um, a, you know, a full blown movie about um, the giant squid because it was just it makes you know they they eat great white sharks every once in a while just for fun. It's just, a, it's just amazing. Anyway, science does that all the time with things, and I have thrown questions at them time and time again. They just look at me with blank stares. Um, one of my favorites, and we, we probably might get into this later, was there was a, um, 
uh, astrophysicist from Georgetown University who was approached by a German television team. It's like, you and Mark, you're going to do a debate. But we know that scientists don't like debates because, you know, when you apparently when you get a PhD, you have a hard time talking for whatever reason. You just get really tunnel visioned. You do. I do you know, you, you get so focused that articulation just goes out the window. So it's like, okay, we're going to record uh, video things from each of you and just pass them like notes in class. You're never going to talk to each other. It's like, oh, okay. And so I gave him five science questions and he folded and that was, and that was it. And I, to be fair, one of the reasons he folded is because there's, when they get so specialized, they, they're really uncomfortable talking about things that aren't in their wheelhouse. Yeah, so yeah. they'd rather just say, yeah, I can't talk about that. So we're not going to do it. So, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and a lot of people think that science is this, this institution that is, totally unbiased and doesn't right. have a narrative or agenda at all, which couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, yeah. Science, you know, I made a couple, I made a clue called they're hiding God, but there, you know, which is that science, once the science, the foundation of science was built, they developed, started developing their own agendas and they really became their own church the, with oh, their yeah. own high priests. And, yeah. The tech, as we develop technological advances within our civilization, they, through osmosis, <laughs> grabbed more and more people in. But, but again, it was just in the general umbrella of science. So, yeah, yeah, they got their own agenda, but I don't know, unless at the, maybe at the highest levels, do they even know what they're doing? Uh, the, the big one for us, though, was the, the reinforcement of space which I'm sure David mentioned many times, which is just about every story. And I, we, we now look at the subtext. There's, there's two things we, we've noticed. One is, is they run regular, like a drumbeat stories about space. Just, you know, and, and it doesn't matter if you even read the article. It's like, oh yeah, there's something funny on the top of Saturn. There's uh, the spot on Jupiter's weird. We're reclassifying Pluto and blah, 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 blah. Oh, and, and every month there's some at near Earth asteroid coming by. Or it's every freaking month now. And it's all the, the subtext is because you're you're living in a glo on a globe in, in, in impossible space over and over and over. They would do this, you know, uh, Mars space, Jupiter space and Saturn space and all that. The other the other thing they do and I don't know if they do this through Hollywood deliberately, but we've become hyper aware of it, is it doesn't matter what television show or movie you've watched in the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years at least, you will find globes in places that should not be there. And there was this little story about, and, and I'm to, we're talking, I mean, yeah, fine, you, you, classrooms, I get it, right? But why is there always a globe on the top of a filing cabinet in a detective's office in New York or Chicago or whatever, or in a doctor's office or this multi-billionaire's office, just these weird random globes. And they're always in frame. And you say, oh, well, it's just it happens that it's like, no, 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 it's not. And when, when we, there was this little story that came out about three or four years ago about hidden producers, the, one of the easiest things to do in the world, if you know anything about Hollywood, which is you can walk into any studio and say, Hey, I'd like to donate twenty, thirty thousand dollars to your television production and or movie. And it's like, okay, what do you want for it? You want a credit? Nope, don't want a credit. Uh, do you want a percentage? Nope, don't want a percentage. What do you want? Um, I want to help stage this particular room in this scene, in this script. It's like, all right, they'll take your money. They don't care. They're like, hell yeah, we'll take it. Sure. What the, what the hell do we care? And so the, the silent producers, and so they'll, they'll like, you know, change a color here, change there, and then they'll put a globe somewhere. It's just one of the weirdest, weirdest things. So between those two reinforcements and, of course, putting the globe in the classroom for, for every student right underneath the American flag for years and years, it's the most amazing conditioning ever. Sorry, long-winded like, answer to your thing. It's like ambient heliocentrism. It is. Well, think about think about the globe in the classroom. Again, remember after 12 years, you know, the American flag in the classroom, there's people that join the military half based on the fact they've seen the flag so many times. Exactly. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, it's flag where I live. I'm willing to fight for that. Oh, yeah, it's the globe. That's where I am. I'm willing to fight for that, too. If there was a way to do it, you enter Space Force. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Space Marines is a real thing, right? <laughs> Starship Troopers. Oh God! Or well, heck, Starship Troopers or Aliens, the sequel, yes. James, the James Cameron movie. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Or, crazy. or the, the the comedy, the the sitcom called Space Force now that's out there with Steve Carell. I can't what? even sit through it. I've never heard of that. 
oh my god you ought to watch it it's called space force and it is about this fifth branch of the military that's just this parody of itself and this joke that uh although i think they do go to the moon at one point but whatever yeah crazy. but it's a comedy obviously with steve carell headline in it yeah it's supposed to be a comedy right it's probably more like a a uh a what am i not cringe cringe fest that's right what I'm well i mean i i can't i can't sit through it it's just painful yeah steve carell not a big fan of him anyway but so there are many people who might not know this who aren't into flat earth and haven't looked into it but there's various different sort of forms of cosmology like there's the puddle theory right there's the you know the bubble theory of being inside of a firmament yep. uh what could you maybe go over a few of those and, and yeah describe? not everyone in the flat earth community and you in fact you'll know this if you end up watching the documentary uh which is um that only about 70 75 percent of the community even believe in a dome uh everyone believes it's flat right in fact most of most people believe in our community believe it's tabletop flat but only about 70 percent believe that we're in living inside like a truman show you know that there's a big snow globe thing on top of us uh and then there's another group of people that and we're kind of mixed on you know uh, is this a one-off which i doubt you know or are there more of these things you know more puddles you know if you're going to make one why would you just make one make more you know with different stages of, of um uh evolution or whatever you want to call it uh but yeah yeah my only argument against the non-dome theory goes along with the whole uh, uh air pressure versus vacuum yes problem which is really a big issue <laughs> which is which is thermodynamics says that pressure cannot exist to next to non-pressure without a without a barrier yeah right you know so the same you blow up a balloon with your your hand you let go with your fingers a million times a million times it's gonna take off because the pressure is trying to equalize and there's so many other examples of that the the one I, I throw at people in science i have yet to find a scientist that'll that'll come at me which is um it's let's say your room let's say there's a second story above your room and you turn it into a little vacuum chamber you have a valve and you pull it right and you pop pop the cap on that thing what happens well it's not like the movies the movies are wrong so many times for plot issues right which is the 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 air equalizes absolutely instantly it's violent it's horrible it's not like we only got two minutes of air left get the duct tape and put on the spacesuits no no no. it's you're you're done that that is over so the air will rush up immediately upstairs into your room equalizing so why well because the the the, the power of that vacuum just destroys gravity Right. And the smaller example is you, you know, sucking uh, soda out of a glass. You know, you create a, a small vacuum force. Well, when you walk outside, why is our atmosphere still here? And because it's like, well, because we've got an atmosphere sitting next to the biggest vacuum of all time, if you believe mainstream science. Right. And and people and people a knee jerk reaction because it's the only answer they have in science is, well, it's got to be gravity. You mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room? just now from going upstairs the exact same gravity i even had a guy stop in mid-sentence he's well there's more like more gravity really more is that what you're gonna say so if that's the if that's the case then then um the the dome theory really really holds a, a lot better i mean there's doesn't the whole greenhouse gas effect you know mean a lot more if it's an actual greenhouse yeah yeah the whole i, I never understood as a kid anywhere the fluorocarbons and everything they get up to the top and then what exactly they suppose you just stay there it's like, no <laughs> no they'd be shredded they'd be they'd, they'd take off i've even had one person let me give one quick more quick example for you i had one person say well it's really thin and kind of wispy up there and so the the, the vacuum doesn't have a lot to pull off of and i go that is not how it works <laughs> at all so i'll give you i'll give you the quick example the uh the example i had was uh take it take it we'll take an ordinary cardboard box an amazon box how's that and Inside that, that box, you put a little, you make sure the bottom is, is held together by only a little bit of tape, right? So it has very little resistance. And you, and you put some packing popcorn in there. Pick up the box. What happens? Nothing happens, right? Because the packing popcorn doesn't weigh anything. Yes. Well, you put the box back down and then grab a whole bunch of books and put it on top of the packing pop popcorn, right? And then try to lift up that same box. What's going to happen? The, bo the, the books are just going to punch. It's going to push everything straight down and the uh, uh, everything's going to fall to the floor. There you are. You, everything's going to fall to the floor. Well, 
would it's like okay what's that analogy of well that would be the atmosphere the vacuum of space doesn't care about that packing popcorn at the edge of space it's going after everything it's going after the packing popcorn it's going after the books it's going after the oceans everything that's not nailed down and some of it we did, which is would be just completely torn off mm -hmm. and never no one ever ever touches it so well and also there is uh, by researching this i found out there's a lot of people who believe in a firmament because of the bible Sure. The, yeah, it's mentioned all the time. Sure. Is Gen it more... Genesis uh, 1 8, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, and sep uh, firmament separating the waters above and the waters below. Yeah. Or so... or the tombstone of uh, Werner von Braun, which I thought was very intriguing. Yeah. And I will take credit for that one, which is uh, it's it, it's just you'd think it'd be this giant, you know, Werner von Braun, right? You think it'd be this giant statue with him pointing at the sky and a big racket behind him. No, it's just this modest, modest headstone. The year he was born, the year he died, and then Psalms. Uh, oh, crap. I think it's 19.1. And I had to look it up. I was going, what is it said? And, uh, the, the, and he's not a religious guy, or at least I didn't think he was. And the verse says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Like, why would the why would the father of rocket science be reaching out from the grave and, and throwing that little breadcrumb yeah. out there? Don't know. Exactly. Exactly. So you do you more come from the the pressure argument or the uh the biblical or a mixture of both? Both. Because when I was making the clues, I got grief from the Christian community. I, I was raised uh, born again evangelical Christian. You know, son, this church was not just a Sunday thing. Uh, you know, there was youth group, there was vacation Bible school, there was Camp Malibu during the summer, and so on and so on. But when I left my very secluded island up near Canada, I. Uh, I fell away from that uh, for obvious reasons. One, because I was sheltered and now I wasn't sheltered anymore. And two, that I got into the tech world. I mean, I played video games for a living. And so we were, you know, no, nobody in my crew went to church ever. And so um, uh, the, the, the Christian community came at me and said, you're, you're kind of bobbing and weaving and dancing around the whole God issue. You have to address this in the clues. And so I said, you know what? You're right. So I made a clue called They Are Hiding God. And I said, okay, here's my opinion on it, which is science has a vested interest to protect its foundation. And if they found like a lot of things, right? There's some things that can be hidden. I mean, the, the, you gotta remember how the end of Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark was, where they put it in a cardboard box or put it in a wooden box and they yeah. put it in a warehouse and no one ever saw it again. Exactly. Right? They had a vested interest in hiding this world the way it was, mostly because by the time they figured it out, which was about 1960, it was too late. It was, you know, found the foundation of, of the world had been cast, the concrete had hardened, and they weren't going to take any chances. People in power don't take those sort of chances. So, and I agreed with them. It's like 1960, that was only 13 years after Roswell. No, they weren't going to roll those dice. So they just said it was one of the shortest Illuminati meetings ever. <laughs> but it was like, how, what could go wrong? And right, and people were going, oh, economically, academically, religiously. And, and then finally some guy at the end that, who was smoking, because they all do, uh, and as well, yeah, we're not going to tell anybody for a while. <laughs> so let's just keep, keep a wrap, you know, keep this under wraps for a while. And they did for, for a long, long time until just recently. So what happened in 1960? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, 1960 was when uh, the Antarctic Treaty was roughly 1960. So what happened was, imagine you had the maps of what this world looked like, going all the way back to, I don't know, 1600s France, right? You could have been the most powerful man in, in, in Europe. What are you going to do with it? You got, you got wooden ships, you got horses. You don't have the tech to do anything. You can't go to Antarctica. You die. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible place to go to. So it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution and most notably um, not until the internal combustion engine was made before they could even verify the old maps, which was, uh, and they sent Admiral Byrd, Admiral Richard Byrd, to the uh, uh, North Pole in 1926. And whatever he found, despite, doesn't matter if you believe the myths or the legends or whatever, whatever he found up there freaked him out so bad that they said, okay, you're going to Antarctica and you're just going to start flying. You're going to fly and fly. We're going to send you better planes and better planes and better planes. And that's all he did. The rest of his career, off and on, he just kept going. He flew down there for, for not, from 1926 all the way up until um, 1956. 
flew around in, in doing Navy missions down there looking for what I call the outer barrier or the outer marker. You know, getting refueling stations, just keep flying and flying. And at one point, I think they gave up. I think they were like, oh, he's been flying down there for 30 years. Can't find anything. We, we got to shut this thing down, right? So he goes on television in 1954. Uh, for a wonderful uh, show. It was like the 60 minutes of his day called The, the Long Jeans. I pronounced it wrong. I pronounced it Long Jines, and I had older people calling him up. It's says, Long Jeans. It's a watch. <laughs> you should know this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't... Long Jeans Chronoscope. <laughs> you know, watchmakers. Popular... Because a watchmaker is sponsoring a television show in America. Yes, yes. <laughs> Apparently they did. And he was on there, and he was he was he was talking about the very next mission, which was Operation Deep Freeze, 1955 to 1956. And he was prepping for it. He'd sent recon teams down there, and he was talking about all this stuff that was going on in Antarctica. You know, it was all these countries down there, and and they found a mountain range made out of coal and oil and and uranium, which he wasn't supposed to talk about. And he's going, I I think we may even go to war down there before it's over. You know, there's all so much stuff. To, to, to go after and he goes down there during operation deep freeze and then right after that everybody you know after all those things he said about all the countries you know fighting over antarctica everything just stopped meaning they just locked that place down of course that's murphy's law right so everyone's getting ready and all of a sudden i'm not saying he found frost giants in front of a giant <laughs> gate right anything like that but whatever it was, they, they, they started drawing up the Antarctic Treaty almost immediately. And the Antarctic Treaty, which was ratified in 1959, the exact same time as when Van Allen from NASA said that, oh, yeah, the Van Allen belts, no one should ever go up, ever, for any reason. <laughs> Super deadly up there. Horrible, horrible radiation. No one should go up. Think about what happened in 1959. They seal off the outer marker and the upper marker simultaneously. The odds that NASA was founded in 1958 and the uh, the high and then on a side note, the high altitude uh, atomic weapons program was, was started in 1958, where a lot of people don't realize that the United States and, and uh, USSR were firing nukes. All the tests from 1958 until 1962 were straight up just firing nukes. Why were they firing? Because that's what men do. Right? Yeah, you know, it's like you find the outer marker. No, no, no. Think about this. You find yeah, the outer yeah. marker. What's the first thing? It's like, well, that's a really big looking wall. Get the cannon. Yeah, exactly. Let's fire at it. Yeah, cannon's not working. Like, oh, what else we got? We got rockets. It's like, it's like, you know what? Grab one of those new things. And 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 after the, and then seriously, the first two shots, two or three shots, were in the low megaton range. This was back when megatons were a pricey proposition, right? Not not nowadays, where you can get megatons down at 7-Eleven. Well, after that, it was low, medium kiloton range. And they were I knew what they were doing. They were painting the sky. Basically, they were shooting paintballs at the ceiling, trying to figure out the measurements, because eventually, they were going to have to figure out how far they could go. Because eventually you're going to, and seriously, within, after those first three shots, that's when NASA was founded. Once they figured out, it's like, well, you got anything bigger than Megaton? <laughs> no? Well, all right, well, we got a fake space, I guess. So they did. And, and that's, that's the, how the program started up. And they militarized space, which was brilliant. Why? Because NASA is a collection of parts. Don't forget that the NASA is just a, it's a military organization, but they get all their parts from, you know, Lockheed Martin and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and General Dynamics and those guys. Well, those are the guys with the, the stuff. What you don't want to happen is that you don't militarize space. And then some day down the road, you have uh, Lockheed Martin teaming up with, I don't know, Frito-Lay to put some sort of weird banner on the moon, right? <laughs> it's like, and then all of a sudden they keep crashing. <laughs> and they're like, it's like why do our rockets keep blowing up it's like oh, i don't know <laughs> you don't want that conversation to happen yeah, so yeah. in a very short amount of time so anyway so after the antarctic thing the antarctic treaty so let me back up for a second the antarctic treaty says that no one can go to antarctica from a corporate standpoint no corporation can set up shop in antarctica forever Forever. And you, it's not a hard treaty to find. It's online. It's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. And it's not even up for review until 2041. Right? And it was start, found in 1959. Not even up for review until 2041. Why? why you know, 
And that was one of the big red flags for me when I was making the clues was only because I'm from America, right? Which is like the world runs on greed and money and power. It's how it's, all, it's run. It's always you know, capitalism, you know, wins all the time. But you're telling me no matter how much money my, my company has, I can't do anything in Antarctica? I mean, come on. If you're an oil and gas company, right, you have gobs of liquid resources on your on your hands right yeah. if you wanted to start fracking in your neighbor's backyard tomorrow maybe not tomorrow but next week you could make that happen in in most places and it has i mean come on they've they just rolled through any place you can frack they have fracked but those same companies not only are they not allowed to go down there this is the part that blew me away they're not even allowed to talk about it that's the part you're not even allowed to do those you know run a full page ad like let's say british petroleum perfect example british petroleum you should be running full page ads in the London Times month after month after month saying how great it would be you know, you know, to do, set up shop in Antarctica, loads of resources and jobs and, you know, better living for, for Britons. They're not even allowed to talk about it. They're not even allowed to protest. And the reason, again, it's an easy thing to do. You just have someone in the government contact the head and CEO or whatever company and say, okay, so because of national security, and I can't tell you why, you can't go down there ever. And whoever replaces you, you have to give them my business card and then we will talk to that person as well. And this goes on in perpetuity, right? So that that's how it works. And it's brilliant. It's, it's an easy enough plan. And the reason why you do this is because of a, a simple argument, which is you, you, let's say you have British Petroleum or Exxon or Mobil or whoever is down there, right? These guys have resources, they have equipment, plane goes off course goes off course a lot and then see something it shouldn't well that's a loose end how many loose ends do you have to i mean that was again a short illuminati meeting <laughs> where it's like so you know it's like what about helicopters and then all of a sudden you know the the table of people start to like, what about this and it's like well they got you know what sort of technology we're we talking about and then finally someone it's always some guy at the end of the the, the table goes look just just shut it down. Just close it off. No one goes down there. The oil company is like, yeah, we're going to lose a lot of money. We're talking probably, you know, a trillion dollars in oil at least. It's like, don't care. <laughs> don't care. The the publicity, it's too much. It's too much, too many loose ends to hold up. Plus, let's say some somebody makes it out of there. Right? You know, one of those movie scenes where somebody, you know, with a plane goes off course, the transponder dies, and then they make it back to civilization. No. No, never, ever going to happen. So that's why Antarctica has been shut down forever. It, uh, it's just too risky. Say, it, and the same logic would be, let, let's go over to the NASA side of things. It was the same logic behind uh, why there was never any stars in any of the moon photos. Yeah, exactly. Which was, it's an easy enough thing. And I'll, in fact, I'll even, I'll even, I'll, I'll take that and I'll jump over to the YouTube thing, which is a great argument. So... You, you have the stars, right? But then you got nerds that are sitting at the sidelines going, you know, the belt of Orion is going to be in the wrong place at this particular time during the day. It's like, no one's going to, it's like, I noticed. It's like, it's like oh God. So, and, and it's like, you can't do the math, right? All the shots will be way too tough to do. I mean, again, if a star is out of place, even in the slightest, right? Yep. It's, and this is like, we're talking about 1969. And so finally somebody says, just no stars. Just don't even, don't even put it away. And it's like, what do we say about the no stars? Well, it's an exposure setting. Yeah, but w w wouldn't there be an exposure setting that would show stars? Doesn't matter. It'll just tell the astronauts they never saw stars. It's like, all right. All right. And, it, and it worked. The same thing goes along with, and I know I'm kind of ranting here, but the same thing goes along with the, um, the spacesuits. Look up, yeah. if you ever get a chance, look up the early videos of spacesuits in the mid-1950s when they were trying to design the, the early space program. Uh, which was they were all really, really heavy plastic or metal or hybrids. And they had to be because the whole pressure thing, right? You can't use a soft suit because it would just turn into a, a parade float, you know, and they just tip over <laughs> and, and they, you know, the thing would burst open. And then some genius, some genius, well, probably not a nerd, probably some guy at the end. It's like, what if we just use a soft suit and we just put it on TV? And it's like, uh, because people are noticed, like, Americans don't know much about physics. We go through high school after high school. We don't teach much about physics, right? They're never going to figure that out. And I'll be damned if that didn't work. Because 
doesn't matter how many people I have talked to, and, and I, especially out of this country. If I leave the United States and I, I go talk to people, I go, I go, yeah, I get why Americans believe in the moon missions, right? Rah, rah, rave the, wave the flag, we're the greatest, right? But why are you in Sweden? Why do you believe that the Americans went to the moon? And everybody, no matter what country, they say the same thing. And they go, well, because it was on television. And I go, well, yeah, I trusting. Go, I go, really? And they and I go, I go, there's lots of things on television. Yeah, but this was the news. The news is never fake. And I go, <laughs> I go, and, and then I try to get away from the fake news argument. And I say, because the Americans would never lie about anything, ever. Uh, there was, a, I'll give you a, a quick, quick perception thing real fast, which is when I went to, when I was doing an Egypt thing to look at the pyramids, I, uh, I, I was running into these group of high schoolers and they were looking at me like I was some sort of demigod. And I was like, and, and this was before Flat Earth, right? I'm going, well, what's the deal with the kids, right? And, the, and it's like, oh, you're the first American they'd seen outside of television. And I go, and? <laughs> so what? I go, I go everyone's television's television. I go, and it, it occurred to me, I go, what kind of shows do you watch over here? And they go, oh, you know, all the good American shows. Dallas, Dynasty, Falcon's Crest. It's like, I go, what do you mean? When all the, where all the Americans are incredibly rich millionaires and sometimes billionaires? It's like, yeah, that's what it's like, isn't it? I go, yeah, now I can see why everyone wants to get American visas. <laughs> they still call it the new world. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, exactly. sorry. Don't be sorry. That's, that's what we're here for, to hear you talk. Um, so how did the narrative morph from militarizing space slash lying about it to yeah. sort of uh, epitomizing our insignificance. <sighs> kind of one and the same in that when you reinforce space over and over and over again, you're without even without even condemning religion, you are creating a model of the universe that is so vast and so incomprehensibly it, since it since it supposedly has no borders, you can't literally get your head around it, right? That's one of the reasons, one of the allures of, of flat Earth, in that you say, "Oh yeah, by the way, in this is a, a universe with so many zeros at the end of it that it's meaningless, that the math is meaningless. You are a tiny little rock covered in a tiny little bit of water and an even tinier little bit of smoke, flying through it at." impossible velocities and you could be snuffed out at any given time then forget about the asteroids gamma burst your sun going supernova you know binary star collision whatever it is just all sorts of alien invasion that's so far down the list <laughs> and yet they'll we still make movies about it because it's more yeah. interesting mm -hmm. um but during that process when you do that you create you 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 diminish everything including everything on the earth including religion Religion is just fantasy. It's just a, it's just a wish. It's just hopeful thinking. That's all it really is. And that that helps science. I mean, it helps build. The only thing that doesn't work in their favor, thank God for the masses, is that the intellectuals, the the people that follow science to their ultimate end, which is you know your masters or your PhD and being published in whatever discipline, is that you're still the minority. And I, I try to make that very clear to the science people I run into. I go, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All the high schools that I had to deal with over the years, I go, I go, chess club was pretty small. <laughs> and the physics club was even smaller. I go, these were very, very small groups. I go, the reason why flat earth has such a, a broad appeal is because the audience is very, very broad. Meaning the, the clues, again, I was, I lucked out because of the training I had professionally is that I learned I used to teach proprietary software to blue collar factories, different parts of the country. And you learn that even though your software is made by nerds and very, very expensive and very broad and very complicated, they are only going to use probably 10% of it. You got to figure out what 10% it is and then dumb it down to where you can explain it to someone who's no offense is, you know, it's got a name tag on their, on their chest. And you know, again, per people that don't use a lot of computers. This was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And apply that to flat earth. You know, when I when I made the clues, I took the flat earth concept and took the solar system model and just erased it from the blackboard. 
and drew in very large font with with almost no math. I don't think I even used math in the clues at all. Just said, okay, here's why I think it's flat Earth. It's really easy to understand. Here's A plus B plus C, you know, and, and so on. And I'm going to start really slow for you. And, the, and it was easy to digest chunks. The videos were not even 15 minutes long. Very, very short. Very, and, and I, you know, spoke in a very soothing, you know, tried to try to make the delivery as clear as possible. Didn't try to get, okay, it's flat earth. You know, I didn't try to, you know, lose my, my stuff. And it, and it resonated for, and with, with a lot, the, the cross section was amazing. The amount of people the, now granted, um, I, I knew the limitations. Anyone that had a bachelor's degree in a physical science or higher was immune to it. Absolutely immune. And if you had a master's degree or higher in a physical science, it was over. In fact, if you had a master's degree in anything, you're pretty much done. But if you had a bachelor's degree in not a physical science, which a lot of people do, you actually, there, you had a chance. You, you could get your head around it. But, but what I did was, you know, again, condensed the, the whole cosmos down to a snow globe, which I thought, honestly, I thought there was going to be like a small percentage, and I had no scientific basis for this. There was a, you know, a small percentage of people that were going to freak out and lose it. And maybe like, you know, crawl into a bottle in a fetal position and like, oh, no. But that's not what happened. Um, in fact, we, yeah, it crunches everything back down, but it's very comforting to a lot of people, which is simultaneously, yeah, it turns the, the whole universe into a studio apartment, but it's very comfortable and it was meant just for them. It's like a studio apartment with your name on the door. Yeah. And that, that is really reassuring to a whole bunch of people. And that was, that was wonderful to see. So, I think it's interesting that the Christian community and nothing, no, no offense to any Christian out there, but that they really, I like, I never heard any Christian like my grandma or anything like that ever mention flat earth or the firmament or anything like that. But as soon as the flat earth movement started gaining traction, yeah. it seemed like a lot of Christians really leapt onto it. Uh, and it, I mean, it's not like Christianity is the only religion or no, cosmology no. that is that is talked about flat earth right no no not at all i mean i've got some wonderful i'm sure david showed you some wonderful images just about every culture even the greeks even though people's like oh no, the greeks discovered it's like screw the greeks don't worry about the greeks everybody else drew the same thing which was some sort of snow globe um but the christian the, the christian community especially in the united states really latched on to it uh because in fact i was there were several flat earth christian conferences that i was not even invited to because i wasn't christian enough which i thought was amazing i don't think david was invited either <clears throat> but they they latched on to it because if you have a belief if you if you are strong you know in in the belief of a creator but you're only like 90 93 percent give or take this will take you another four or five percent and for a lot of people that's more than enough to tip the scales even even further and so the in fact the, um, uh, the christian community again which gave me so much so much grief about not dealing with it once i made the 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 video called they are hiding god they just well the are the late rob skiba he was one of the first guys he was a big biblical prophecy guy and once he got into it he went through the the bible with a flat earth or flat earth comb fine tooth comb might as well have been a flat earth comb and when he was done he he called me up he goes yeah it's flat earth book i go really i go i didn't know i mean i don't know every chapter and verse not by a long shot and he goes no he goes the only verse in the bible that even hints at a globe is Isaiah 40, 22, he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. He goes, but in Hebrew, he goes, circle's not globe, it's not ball, it's not sphere, it's a completely different word. Dinner plate is circular, or your dining room table is circular, hubcaps and everything everything else. He goes, that's it. And what, unfortunately, and maybe it was by design, there were so many pastors out there that just held on to that Isaiah verse like grim death. It's like it, like it had veto power over the entire rest of the Bible. And it's like, really? Over Genesis? Because Genesis talked about the fervor. It's like, no, 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 Isaiah. Because they, they were afraid of the backlash. That was the, the, the big drawback of Flat Earth is it's so um, polarizing that it polarizes everybody. It doesn't matter who it is. So pastors are afraid to talk to their congregations about it because they're afraid of, of losing the audience. Like anyone up on, you know, anyone up in front of a microphone, they're afraid of losing the audience. Heck, <clears throat> before David got on Alex Jones, 
they contacted me four years earlier, four years <laughs> earlier, right? And the, the producer meeting was so weird. They go, okay, how long can we do a show about Flat Earth without actually saying Flat Earth? <laughs> go, what? <laughs> I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. Like if I if I do a tap dance, maybe. And it's like, yeah, we can't take the risk. Sorry, I can't do it. What? And, yeah, uh, Alex no. Jones? <clears throat> Alex Jones. And, and But he wasn't alone. I mean, there were a number of producers from different areas that were just scared to death of, of, um, uh, of, of being tied to it because they, they weren't sure. They were nervous about the, the, the audience backlash. Hell, the, um, uh, the first conference we did down in... Uh, uh, Raleigh, uh, back in 2017, which is where the, the finale of the, the documentary was, uh, Howard Stern sent a team down there and he would not go down to it himself because he didn't want to get, you know, lumped up in that. It's like, why are you here? And, and people, in fact, it was, the media was so, was so weird. The first day of the conference, a lot of people don't know, you'll send recon producers to whatever event, usually in the first day. And there were all these recon producers walking around uh, the conference because they didn't think it was real right they didn't think it was like a, a real thing and then all of a sudden you could just see them it's like picking up their phones within the first 30 minutes going yeah you get a sense of people down here like right now and the next day the whole lobby was just jammed i mean i was wearing three hot mics simultaneously wow for, and I, I had no idea who i was talking to at, at one point eventually we settled the the, the main clip we used was abc news but everybody i mean they flew in from france and germany and england it was awesome so Cool. Yeah, but polarization, big problem for our team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you think another reason that they want to keep people away from Antarctic is because uh, of what might be beyond it? I mean, oh, yeah. some people believe that the, the outside of the ring, there's another whole ring of different... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the, the wonderful story, um, the Iron Republic, I don't know if it's real or not, but it's a, it's a great story about civilizations that live beyond our civilization. Do I think, if, one of the reasons I, I get to do this, some of the things I do is I put myself in the shoes of other people. A lot of empathy. So I put my, I, I will actually put my, my, my mind in the, in the heads of, we'll just say the Illuminati for better, or let's call them the authority. Right, because nobody knows who it's at. The first rule of power is stay hidden. Nobody knows who's at the very top. Yes, I think the Vatican's probably up there, but it's probably some European family you've never ever heard of. Because the first rule of power is again stay hidden. Yes. So, I think for them, it, the the big thing was don't let's just not take the chance. So, like with the oil companies or private companies, all it takes is one one group to go off rails, you know, to go off road. And then you don't know what, what you, you don't want to keep track of them. So do I think physically we that they had the technology maybe even 20 years ago to make it to the outer marker? Nah, doubt it. But you're not going to take that chance. Why risk it? It's kind of like mob thinking, you know, if it well, what was that one line? Um, oh, it was Robert De Niro line. Uh, if there ever is a doubt, there is no doubt. Right? Meaning you don't, you just don't, you don't roll the dice. You just may, you do not take those chances. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a, I like that idea or that idea makes sense to me because a lot of people are going, well, if these, the cabal or whatever you want to call them are chemtrailing us to death or right. poisoning the earth, so on and so forth, like they live here too. So why would they poison their own well? Yeah. Well, if they have someplace else to go, that would make sense. Yeah, I've toyed with that idea as well. Uh, the only problem I have with it is eventually you got to have a bunch of these, wh whatever, whoever they are, disappear. Sure. And that seems as good a place as any to end the first free hour. To hear the second hour and 20 or so minutes, go to patreon.com slash the melt podcast. And for as little as three measly dollars a month, you can get access to full episodes, early episodes and exclusive episodes. And also uh, you will be able to join the conversation that we have every month at the melt meetup. Um, yes, in the second hour, we talked about the cabal behind the cabal, Admiral Byrd, ambient globalism, celebrity flat earthers, flat earth as positive conspiracy theory, and you get to hear Hunter and I's commentary and a lot more. Thank you all so very, very much for 
listening. Uh, hopefully you were able to glean something positive from this and maybe learn a little bit. I don't know. Maybe have your suspicions confirmed. Whatever the case may be, I hope it's positive and there is a lot of great stuff coming your way. So stay tuned and uh, until next time, take care people. <laughs>